Um, so uh, I'm Angie Gonzalez. I'm a healthcare facilitator with the Toronto Network of Specialized Care, and my background is nursing. Um, and I'll let Lindsay introduce herself. Hi, I'm Lindsay. Uh, I'm a care coordinator with the Toronto Central CCAC's Adult Program, and uh, my background is in the developmental sector. So. Yeah. We're really lucky to have Lindsay because she's she's has a huge impact on um, care planning. So uh, the learning outcomes for today, we're going to go over um, some effective strategies in how to to plan for transitions, um, specifically involving healthcare of the person who is a young adult with developmental disability. Um, we're going to also identify um, what are some of the primary care needs that are special for young adults with developmental disability. And how can we collaborate with our other community partners, including hospitals, um, to be able to support someone going through that transition period. And we know, no? oh, okay. we know that um, transition, transition time is really a key point when we can make a huge impact on the trajectory of someone's life, especially a young adult, um, and including the medical and the health pieces, which are essential. So does everybody know what primary care is when we talk about primary care? Who's really familiar with it? Um, primary care is really the first step, the first point of contact with the health system. So, for example, that would be our um, family physicians, the nurses, pharmacists are key people who offer primary care in our community that sometimes we forget about. Um, so just knowing that when we're talking about primary care, we're talking about the first point of contact, which is a very critical point, of course, for people who are transitioning. Does every, has anyone um, heard of HCARD, healthcare and research? In DT? Uh, yeah. So H card, I would I would strongly say if you haven't heard about it, please go to their website. Because this is research that is specific to people with developmental disabilities in Ontario. And this is the evidence that we need to be able to advocate for people in Ontario. Um, so a paper came out, uh, and it's called the Atlas on Primary Care of Adults with Developmental Disabilities in Ontario, and that was in 2013, so fairly recently. It said, this is a quote from it, persons with DD have complex health care needs, but often meet with difficulties when accessing appropriate services. Healthcare providers with little knowledge of how best to serve them pose another challenge. And we know this in our experience. Um, I can say that as a nurse educated here in Toronto, when I graduated, I had no content, no formal content in the cur curriculum about developmental disabilities. Um, so if you had met me when I first graduated, I would have said, Develop okay, I'm thinking maybe syndromes, like Down syndrome, um, but didn't have a lot of understanding of how to communicate with someone with DD um, if they presented in the hospital, for example. Uh, so just have that, that understanding as well that, um, that when you're meeting people in the primary care system, they most likely didn't get a lot of content on, on uh, people with developmental disabilities and what's special about that po population. So we know there are disparities. Um, we, uh, we also know though that from the H card research, I'll keep going back to that, and the website link is actually in your notes. At the end, it says selected references. Um, the H card information talks about how people are using the healthcare system, in particular young adults and, and people who are aging. And they see that um, at the point of 17, that seems to be a really critical point and a blip in the research, where the healthcare needs, um, emergency visits, uh, mental health diagnoses, psychiatry visits, that's when we start to see a blip that goes up um, in terms of usage. So transition, this is someone who's transitioning um, and is at the same time experiencing a lot of complex um, health needs, mental and physical health needs possibly. 
Um, what do you think about this statement that says, I need a healthcare provider with experience in developmental disabilities? Can anyone just um, give some feedback on that? What, they, what, how, what do you think when you, when you read that statement? Well, parents tell me. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Petra. I think that it shows that within the healthcare system, there's a lack of knowledge, and that clearly it's a structural kind of uh, disengagement between disability and healthcare. Yes. Um, so the, there is a, not a lot of capacity in the healthcare system in primary care. Um, however, we're getting, like Petra was saying, we're getting families or caregivers, care providers from agencies, for example, saying. Um, I want somebody who has some experience with DD so that you know the person with DD doesn't get traumatized when they go to the, um, the medical visit. I think this is cutting in and out. <laughs> okay. We don't have any other mics left except this one. <laughs> Try to be loud. <laughs> That's hard for me. Um, so yeah, any more thoughts? Uh, specifically when it comes to deaf persons with uh, disabilities. My apologies, sorry. Speaking to deaf persons with disabilities, uh, I do work at the Bob Rumble Association for the Deaf, along with uh, other people here at BRCD. And uh, it's these additional things. It's a person who's deaf who has a developmental uh, disability uh, something and so there's that layer of knowing how to negotiate or uh, deal with someone who's deaf I mean there's high functioning and low functioning clients uh, but doctors seem to kind of feel paralyzed about how to interact with deaf people including myself when I go along with the client and very often they kind of look at you and it's patronizing you know I'm very sorry for you and so that's the additional layer that we often intersect with. Yeah. And, and you, thank you so much for saying that. That really summarizes the experience of, of many, many people with developmental disabilities and some kind of communication difference. So our other, there are other people as well who have a different way of communicating, whether it's you know, nonverbal or um, with some words, but communication is definitely a huge barrier. And um, the physicians and nurses and, and other um, allied healthcare, they do not have the experience. So who will bring that experience? It's going to be us. And that's why we're having all these training events and trying to boost our confidence in terms of advocating and bringing that piece to, to um, healthcare. So this is just a summary of a survey from the DD Primary Care Initiative back in 2011 with physicians and nurse, nurses and nurse practitioners. And, it, and they still do um, DD elective series with med students and nurses. And they ask, what is a major barrier? And it's exactly what you're saying, James, is that communication, is, it makes them feel paralyzed. How do I understand if this person, if you're consenting to the information I'm giving you. Um, how do I communicate uh, what, I, what I need to, for my assessment? Um, how do I communicate the interventions so that the person can be well informed? Communication is key um, and it's a huge barrier that paralyzes healthcare providers. They don't know what else to do. Again, who's going to help with that piece, that gap? It's us. Um, they, they are used to doing acute care and complicate, complex care. They have people um, who are seniors who have multiple um, medical issues. So they are used to complex care. Uh, and they, they have the knowledge to do it. It's, there, it's the developmental disability piece um, that involves communication barriers that, that might chew. Also information sharing. Um, so who's their team that they can reach out to is sometimes a big gap. And um, communication works together with behavior. Um, and how do you support some complex behaviors to be able to tolerate tests? Simple tests like, for example, our blood pressure. Again, that, that's going to be us doing the social stories. 
Um, so we really are a key partner in um, transition and particularly medical transition. Just going to skip through the other responses, which is finding enough time. We all know that the physicians and nurses they have the OHIP might pay them for eight minutes of, of an assessment. Um, and how do you assess someone with really complex needs in eight minutes without having uh, efficient communication? And interestingly, physicians and nurses said that a lack of community resources for the psychosocial piece was, um, was something that they faced and, and feared. So um, in your swag bag, there is an orange tool book. And uh, oh, it's an orange tool book that was created in 2011. It, the consent, it's, um, it involves tools for family physicians and nurses. And this was an attempt at a way of trying to help um, physicians and nurses to approach a complex situation in a very organized way. So there are tools that talk about um, what do I do if they're complex behaviors? Uh, where do I start? And the, the, uh, the tools are all on a website, Surgery Center's website. There's um, tools for healthcare providers and tools for caregivers. So um, there are, this tool, this tool is actually for both caregivers and healthcare providers. And we all start on the same, um, the same path when we are faced with complex behaviors or complex communication. The, f the first path is what's going on physically. Let's rule out underlying physical health issues. Because if we're approaching without looking at that, we're not addressing an underlying issue that could help to change um, a behavioral profile. And I know Rachel's nodding because we, we had a, a meeting um, this week that really spoke to that. that um, for example, if you have someone that has, is feeling reflux and is banging their chest um, and going to emerge banging their chest, they may present like they have a psychiatric issue or they're banging their head. But we really need to rule out what's underlying physical. And what's our role in that? We're not the physicians, but we, if we're there, if there's any way that we can bring the information about who this person is, how they communicate, um, how you can get them to, uh, to assent to certain tests, that's, the, that's really key. Um, that website, Surrey Center, has uh, a tool, and you guys have gotten lots of tools of, um, in your bag, uh, but this transition tool is from a DD primary care perspective. So I'm just going to swap the mics out in case uh, you can see if this one will work better. Give it a go, we'll see how it goes. So we have a six minute clip on, um, on developmental disabilities and the primary care initiative that is now going to be a program. Why I think this is so important is because this, um, this is what I use in order to advocate with physicians and nurses, is the material that is in the DD primary care guidelines. It's going to be updated sometime uh, this year or next year, but uh, the guidelines go over for each um, particular situation that is highly, uh, something that's frequent for someone with developmental disability what is the, the consideration we should have medically. So in fact, more than the physicians and nurses, developmental service providers have been the ones using this, this tool book and the guidelines, and they use it in a way to advocate with healthcare providers. So if I, for example, um, were talking to the family physician and saying uh, this person is hitting their chest and we want to rule out uh, reflux, for example, taking the guideline that talks about GI, gastrointestinal disorders, the guideline says that reflux is very common and it's something to suspect when there are complex behaviors. Um, and that guideline is written for physicians. So you're taking their own um, material to them to say, you need to look into this. And it talks about how do you look into it, the considerations and ways of uh, things that need to be screened. 
So it's, it's a starting point to have a discussion with the physician uh, and look like, okay, this is evidence that we're bringing to you about people with developmental disabilities. So uh, just quickly to talk about, I know a lot of people here already know a lot about this and how to advocate and um, how to transition someone from pediatric care to adult care in terms of getting a family physician and a nurse. How many of us know, though, which, which of these three models um, would you try to seek out first if you're supporting someone to move from pediatric care to an adult primary care um, physician? Can anyone just shout it out, which one they, they've used and had great success with? Sorry? Family, family physician, family health team? Family health team. Yeah. That's right, so um, family health teams and community health centers, the, those are the, the first points that I, I seek out when someone needs a family phys physician or needs to change because it's not working well. Um, the community health centers uh, are funded differently from someone who is in solo or independent practice. Um, as well as the, uh, there may have, they have a group of services. So they can access nurse practitioners, social workers, um, they, they have diabetes clinics usually, access to a diabetic um, educator. Uh, they may have services that, and Lindsay reminded me of this, this um, is a really important thing. They may sometimes have someone who will visit the person at home. So the family health team have had experience sometimes that there's a nurse practitioner who, or even a physician as well, um, who may be uh, able to visit the person at home. Maybe not every time, um, but if there's a huge case that this person isn't able to tolerate leaving the home at times, um, and we want to rule out the medical, there's, some, there's more flexibility than a solo or physician or independent practice. I guess we could just add, there's a note here about Healthcare Connect. Has anyone heard about Healthcare Connect? No? So it's a program that links people with appropriate primary care physicians. Uh, actually, any, anyone here can use it, any of your clients can use it, or family members. Uh, you can do it online or you can do it by phone. You just need a valid OHIP card, um, and it will essentially match you based on your needs with an appropriate physician that's accepting patients. So it's one way uh, to link up with primary care other than um, you know, using some of the suggestions that Angie's highlighted, like going directly to a family health team or a, a community health center. And this, is, this is all really bringing it back to that first context of uh, that question. I want someone who has experience with DD. Is it realistic? No. I, sometimes we're not going to be able to link someone up to, um, to healthcare providers with specific experience with DD. Sometimes we do. Um, but a lot of the time for a primary care physician who is a generalist, their work is they're generalists. So, and they should really see, at, they see everyone. And talking about integration and inclusion, um, we need to build capacity with, not just with the few that have experience, but with everyone. Um, and a good way to do that is to approach a family health team because it's, it's a team-based model. Um, so I think we sort of went through, we went through that question. And another quick tip before we get to Lindsay is um, even if you have a family health team, there are time constraints. So um, if we are supporting someone to get ready for a medical visit, um, and sometimes I come in to attend medical visits with people, with agencies, and it's a, a, a staff or a counselor <coughs> who doesn't really know exactly why they're there. They have a vague idea of why we're bringing the client to, to, the, um, to see the, the family health team, but they don't have a formulated sentence. That's really key, because when, when we step into the office, we want to have that sentence ready, because there is some obscure research in the States that talks about um, just 18 to 23 seconds. If we start to say, um, why we're here and we're kind of like, well, and we start to tell the story, they're going to interrupt us and they're going to start asking questions and then your agenda might be diverted. So we really, it's very key in helping people with developmental disabilities to prepare for their medical visits. And um, 
There are tools, and these are online at the HCARD website, so the, the, um, the link is listed there. But these were tools that were made with people who are advocates. So the, um, the Advocate for a Better Future group, the ABF group, and John helped with that too, um, they looked over the, what was uh, drafted and they changed it completely to look like something that, that said, okay, this is my tool, this is what I can use to, to get ready for healthcare visits and prepare um, the information I'm gonna share because there's their time constraints, so I have to be ready. And we talked a lot already about the other tools, um, including there are health watch tables in the tool book. So if someone has an identified syndrome, um, it's really key, very important information for the healthcare provider. Um, but sometimes they don't, because they don't have the expertise, um, taking a health watch table that talks about the rare syndromes like 22Q deletion, that's something we see more often um, in, in our work but healthcare providers may not be familiar with it. So taking tools like that, health watch tables, or any information on things like the syndrome and collecting the data. So having that information ready, things like weights, um, bowels, and other things like how's the person sleeping, having really concrete information, more than just saying, they're not sleeping well. I don't, I don't know exactly how many hours per night, but. I know they're not sleeping well. That, that it doesn't help as much as if we have really concrete information. And I know Jennifer talked about the networks of specialized care and introduced you to that. Um, just to let you know that my role is based in the Toronto Network of Specialized Care with the 37 Toronto agencies that offer adult developmental services. Um, I've connected with many people, but I also see many people that I, I haven't connected with. If there's complex needs, and you're suspecting there are gaps in, in health, health care, and continuity of health care, then you can contact me. There isn't a rigorous referral process. It's call, to pick up the phone and call, or email me, and say, this is the situation. Um, do you think it's something that maybe you could, you could come in and help see if there's any gaps, any linkages needed um, in terms of the medical piece? And usually consents are good. So when you're talking or sharing information with any healthcare provider, we know that we need to have, try to get the consents as soon as possible. Now. So I'm gonna suggest we're about five minutes from lunch. So why don't we do some questions for Angie? And we can have Lindsay, you can get going, but I just wanna, we're gonna continue with Lindsay, so don't worry, you're gonna get lots of time with her. But just since we have you, Angie, in the video and that that we played, is there any immediate questions? Okay, so Lindsay, if you wanna go ahead and just, oh, sorry, and look around the whole room. We got one here, hold on. Not really a question, but more of a comment. Um, for me, having worked with clients um, with developmental disabilities, the most frustrating thing when I'm working with healthcare providers is how they, when they can't figure out what's medically wrong, they automatically conclude it's behavioral. And rather than say, I don't know, um, it's just, it's really, and, and we know, like we, we have to advocate and all that, but it's just, it's just that leap that's made automatically is so frustrating. Yeah. It's, it's one that they wouldn't make if it were me going to the doctor and, you know, suggesting something was wrong. Yeah. And, and so anyways, just, I had, a, I had a, a little boy recently, I work in special needs team as well, who uh, was in a very good, good hospital. I'm not gonna say who, where it was. Excellent hospital, excellent care, excellent physicians, staffing great. And was having this recurrent behavioral issue of pulling out his trach. And they took out, the, they looked, they, everything was pristine. Um, you know, it's behavioral, so we had to call in a behavioral therapist, collect the data, blah, 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 blah. Well, this young boy had a great, strong, <laughs> advocate mom who said, did you notice every time he eats, that's when he pulls out his trach, right after. And they ended up finding he had a twisted bowel. So it's just, it's so frustrating. So you're coming back to our point that who, is, who are the people who are going to help the healthcare providers in their assessment? It comes down to very key pieces of information. 
it also we have to be um, empathetic to their role and it's very difficult to, to do assessments without having key pieces of information um, and they also want to balance risk with benefit so they won't do a scope they won't do an invasive scope on someone unless they have a little bit something to go on so that key piece of information from the mom that said after eating we see that this is when it's happened then they'll say okay we have something to go on why we would put someone through more testing so that's a great example okay so i work at the toronto central ccac uh, it's worth noting though there's several ccc's in the province uh one of which is central actually it's not here from central uh which is the north the north part of toronto and up in new york region um so i'll be speaking from toronto central's perspective so, how many of you have heard of CCAC? Okay. What does CCAC do? I'm going to make you give the presentation. What does CCAC do? Anyone? What do you think it does? Long term care. Okay. What else? Yeah. Home care. Yeah. Safety assessment. And for who? Who do we do this for? Okay, so most, usually when I ask that question, what we get back is long-term care, PSW, and working with seniors. We do work with seniors, and we do do long-term care. Uh, we do oversee long-term care, and uh, we do do PSW support. But we also offer services from birth to death. We have a full child and family program. We have an adult supportive care program, which is where I come in. I work with ages 18 to 64 with uh, complex health and social and medical needs. Uh, we have a seniors program, and then we also have a palliative program. So uh, it's not strictly working with seniors, um, which is one of the things we kind of like to discuss. So my role is as a care coordinator. So I work in the community with individuals who have been referred to us because either they have medical issues uh, such as uh, wounds or physical impairments, mobility issues, um, and they require some support to stay in their home. So that's our main goal is to keep people in their home. And recently, um, and unfortunately only very recently, have we been really trying to work collaboratively with our with our developmental services community partners? So I can say from experience when I was doing complex plans before I came into this role that I never used CCAC in my complex planning. Um, and that might have been because I wasn't aware of what they did um, or it just wasn't at the front of my mind. So we're really trying to work more collaboratively with the developmental sector to provide support for individuals in home. And that support includes accessing services, so be it through hospitals, specialists, doctors. Uh, it also means uh, helping people with personal support help, so that could be uh, basic things like dressing or bathing, but we also do uh, respite support, caregiver relief. Um, we also have nurses that go in home and do medical support. We have speech language pathologists that will do communication assessments. We have occupational therapists that will do home safety assessments, but they also do work with addictions and they do work with mental health as well. Uh, social workers that will go into the home. And then another wide range of services, we have pharmacists that will go in home and do medi medication reconciliation for clients. Uh, nurse practitioners that we use a lot to bridge. Uh, traditionally, they work in our palliative system, but more recently we've been using them to bridge individuals from children to adults who do not have physicians yet, or they're on a wait list for a community health team and they require some medical support. And we also offer things like in-home lab work, um, which for a developmental population, I think is important. So doing blood tests and things like that in home, uh, we can do home ECGs, things like that to try and keep a client where they're most comfortable. So within CCAC, CCAC, I mentioned we have a child and family team, so that's under 18, 
uh, where we provide support both in the schools and at home, as well as other areas like Model McDonald House. Um, and then they transition into the adult program. And as everyone here is really well aware and the focus on what we're talking about is that transition can be a bit rough sometimes. So it can be rough in the developmental world, but also in our healthcare system, there's a little bit of a, a gap. So we're really, we've really been working now to develop some pathways starting at a much younger age, like ages 14, 15, 16, to bridge people into the adult healthcare system. What we don't want to see is people with uh, pediatricians up until age 21 and then nothing. And we see that a lot. Um, so we're really working to bridge. And we also want to be able to work with families, get people prepared, how to connect with the DSO, all those sorts of things. So, and we've been working really closely with the developmental sector in how we make those bridges and trying to do things a little bit more creatively than what we've done maybe in the past. So really focusing, as opposed to really focusing strictly on healthcare, understanding that there's other things that impact people's healthcare journey. So developmental disabilities, mental health challenges, all those sorts of things. Um, I wanted to point out, and it's, I don't have a slide for it, but uh, as we're seeing, um, we're unfortunately seeing a lot of younger adults uh, hitting the point where they feel, where their families feel, or the community is really feeling the pressure that long-term care is the one option we sort of have. Um, and we've been really doing a lot of work to try and keep people at home so that young people with developmental disabilities aren't ending up in our long-term care system before they need to or want to. Okay. Um, <laughs> so part of what we're doing is really creating these innovative pathways. So focusing on collaborative care planning. So we can't look at health um, in its separate little sphere and look at the developmental services and it's equally separate sphere when we're transitioning people from children to adults. We really need to develop these very coordinated plans to move people seamlessly through our healthcare system and through through all the systems. Yeah. Well, just that, that CCAC has, um, has to their own tools as well. Um, they're very similar to our tools in our sector, um, but sometimes if we reach out to CCAC and, and say we want to have a care planning meeting, usually um, there might be a tool called the coordinated care plan and that really documents who exactly is in this person's circle of care and that's, that's so key to have that documented um, and bring to emergency department visits or any kind of, of healthcare visit where there's a new healthcare person coming on board. Um, the coordinated care plan is absolutely necessary. And I think we see that sometimes when we're visiting families that are starting to experience crisis, and we ask, um, so who's, who's the lead on, on getting this coordinated care plan together and working with all of us? Sometimes we're all fragmented, and, and we need to have maybe the CCAC care coordinator is going to the, be the lead, or the family service worker will, will be the lead on coordinating. Um, but that's a key part that sometimes we, we're, we're missing. There's also the care program um, that helps with, with collaborative care planning. So there, there are lots of ways to do it. So crisis and emergency, why we're bringing this up with young adult um, transition issues is because we're also seeing in research that uh, this is a particular point in time when people start to use emergency departments more frequently. Um, and we're, we're not ready when it happens. So um, using tools on the age card website, they have developed tools that have been tested with certain um, emergency departments, Sunnybrook being one of them. Um, Sunnybrook had DD Cares project and they recognize um, tools like this, the About Me. Um, and it's something that the nurses they really learned a lot from the process because sometimes they wouldn't even recognize a person had DD. Um, when the project started, they were saying, we don't have people coming to emerge with developmental disability. Shocking, huh? Um, but, but again, no fault of the nurses. Let's go back and realize that the nurses are, were not given that kind of information. Um, so we're the ones that need to, we need to bring it to them and we can use tools like the About Me. And also, um, many of our clients don't have medical alert bracelets, and they have things like seizure disorder or diabetes. 
and um, they may be nonverbal. So yes, they may not be able to tolerate wearing a bracelet, um, but there is a form that a healthcare provider, including a pharmacist, can fill out and get a medical alert bracelet for free. Um, so even if it's worn on a belt buckle or some other creative way of, of having a medical alert bracelet, that's sometimes a piece that's also forgotten. So just to reiterate, kind of, not reiterate, but to add to the importance of this, um, when children under the age of 18 are going to emerge, they're going through healthcare, typically they're seen at sick kids if there's complex health issues. And it's important to remember that beyond the age of 18, they can be seen at any one of Toronto's 27, 20, there's a bunch of hospitals. Um, and all the more reason to have a whole set of information ready because it's going to be you're going to be a new presentation every time you show up at a hospital, which is a little bit different than the historical perspective that they will have if the client was seen at sick kids prior. We're looking at, we're looking at time, so we're, we're trying to prioritize which one is um, okay. the emerge, This was a video that, um, again, on age card, if you look at some of the videos there, they have lots of nice tips. This one was Jill Carlisle, who was talking about um, a premise site type document, that if someone is at risk of having police involvement, especially now we're 17, 18, 19, and that's when we see that peak in police involvement in ED, um, then we should prepare for that. And calling ahead to the local police department, asking for this premise site document, or even just um, talking about identifying this home with consent, of course, um, that if they get a call from this home, can they keep it on file as a red flag? And on that, pre that video, it talks about what are, things t what are some information that the, the police would need in order to flag that home and, and approach it with a, a bit more sensitivity. Um, and this is, this is really a key uh, slide, I think, that um, sometimes from service coordinators or from caregivers, we hear the message that there's been terrible <coughs> discharges. Unbelievable. <laughs> Lucy's laughing because we had this unbelievable discharges where you think, how can a hospital get away with that? Um, a key thing, if the person has, has been discharged and has had a terrible experience, there are patient relations or patient experience offices that should be utilized even if it's after the fact, so that the more that they get documented on clients with DD coming to their eMERGE departments and experiencing um, really, really traumatic things happening, um, the more letters that we write and that the patient relations offices of each of these hospitals receive, it will start to be highlighted more. Um, but I think sometimes we, we go away from that experience and we think, let's avoid that hospital. I do it. <laughs> But um, we, we really, and we don't have time as well to write, to document these things and get back to the patient relations people. But that's one of the things that might start to help because if the client comes back to that hospital, it's already been flagged. And there's, um, I think, the CCC care coordinators. Oh, yeah. So CCC care coordinators exist in the community. We exist in long-term care homes. We exist in shelters. We exist in doctor's offices but we also exist in every hospital in Toronto. Um, and our role in hospital is to facilitate these discharges back into the community. We have a fully rounded out ALC program as well. Are you familiar with ALC, if I use that term? Alternate levels of care? Okay, <laughs> so if people enter into hospital, a lot of times our developmental clients will enter into hospital um, and they will get stuck there because there's nowhere for them to go from hospital at which point you're deemed ALC, which means you don't need a hospital, but there's nowhere else for you to go. So we do have a program designated to kind of target that as well. But our hospital care coordinators work in the hospital to arrange services on discharge, care plans on discharge, negotiate with the hospital. We work as an intermediary there. And the other thing we do is since we're embedded, we work closely with bed flow managers at the hospital. And this is an important tidbit to know because we hear a lot about how often our clients are getting pushed out the door um, of the hospital. The person that controls how long someone stays in a hospital or not, in a bed or not, is a bed flow manager um, who is a hospital administrative staff. So we work closely with them as well to sometimes maybe negotiate, can we have an extra 
10 days so we can figure out a solid discharge plan, a solid care plan, and then this person's not gonna keep coming back to ER every, every week. So it's important to connect with the hospital care coordinators through CCAC if you're able to. to hear um, from, from you some of your experiences or questions, especially um, having Lindsay here. I felt extremely lucky because CCC and, and having this collaboration, having DSO and all their collaborative work with CCC, um, it's stuff that goes on behind the scenes that we don't really know is happening and it has a huge impact. So um, now we have Lindsay as well, if you have experiences or questions about CCC, for example, we wanted to hear your experiences. And in particular, how it relates to um, young adults in transition. I have a question. Are there CCAC coordinators and bed flow managers at PMH also, or just medical hospitals? Right? Yeah, yeah, they're at PMH as well. Uh, whether there's there's what was the question, Lindsay? Can so you repeat the whether question? Whether there's bed flow managers and CCAC embedded at CAMH mm -hmm. um, and the other psychiatric hospitals. Yeah. And yes, there are. The one that we deal with is Wendy. Wendy. Yeah. yeah. Is Wendy, her name is Wendy. Is she the bed flow manager? She supports ALC. So yeah. she kind okay. of keeps track of ALC. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. You won't, you won't, we, <laughs> won't ever interact directly with the admin like the administration at a bed flow level. That's why it's important to target the people that have the connections that you need in order to carry out your discharge plan. Yeah. Although I have to say more and more those bed flow managers are coming to community meetings. Which is so, awesome. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's new if someone is blocking a bed ALC, that kind of thing, you may see bed flow managers um, come to those meetings to kind of push our system a bit to see how what we're doing. Um, I think there's still a big gap in the understanding of what the DS's limits are around resources and that kind of thing. So I think that's a lot of the work that we do as well. Um, I just wanted to point out, uh, just to point to anyone who does have an individual who maybe gets a declar declaration of ALC, um, that would be a really, really important time to call me if the individual has a profile, um, because the DSO does work very closely um, with the sector, and knowing the alternative level of care declaration date is important, and, it's all, and I track them as well. Thanks. manager with Central CCAC, so that includes uh, North York, York Region, and South Simcoe. So we, like Toronto, have an adult population and an adult caseloads. But for the past couple of years, we realized that we have a growing need, particularly in York Region, and I think one of the highest numbers in York Region, actually, of young folks with a developmental disability. And so we realized and appreciated that that population has a very distinct need. So back in October, we decided um, that we were gonna create specific caseloads um, at 21, so when people have transitioned out of high school, um, but I like the model that um, Lindsay has talked about at 18. Um, for those folks living in a developmental group home and or living at home with a complex medical need, and developmental disability. And through that work and through my, my experience for the last three years with the Vaughan Contrigate Care Program, so that's a unique partnership with Developmental Services, Reno, March of Dimes Health, um, of supporting young folks. We have 10 right now with complex medical um, needs, physical disabilities, and potential intellectual disabilities. That, you know, things started going on and lots of conversation to the point now that I'm sitting at the clinical conference table at uh, Toronto DSO, Surrey's Place, 
and at the YSSN clinical table uh, once a month. And even coming here to this group, I'm running into all kinds of people that I, I know and that I'm running into in my networks. So I think, and I'm, I said to Angie and to uh, Lindsay, you know, I'm so grateful that CCAC is on the, on the docket today to have a conversation because we are, we want to work with you and certainly um, I think you guys want to work with us, at least I hope so, um, and we can help in collaboration together. We, you have resources, we have resources, we also all share knowledge and with that we can do some really great work with our uh, patients whether they're in hospital or at home or in group homes. And about a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, I just called some of the key players that I knew in Toronto DS and in York Region DS and I said I want to have a just a conversation about a person's journey from birth to 21 because I need to understand because what I get or what my care coordinators get and I have two of them here today um, you know that crisis call at 21 22 we can't cope anymore and I didn't know the child and youth services etc cetera, etc cetera. and so again I'm grateful that we were able to have a mapping session and all the things that you talked about this morning We've already um, developed that knowledge, which is awesome. We didn't have that six months ago. So thank you. I think we're really lucky to deal with Toronto Central CCAC and Central CCAC and that they're really flexible and really responsive. So I think we should be appreciating the way that our local CCACs work because they're really creative in how they can work with us. So it's great. Uh, my question is, um, I, I wasn't aware that CCAC provided in-house uh, lab work. Mm -hmm. Is that just for individuals that aren't able to physically go to a lab for blood work or an EEG or an injection, or could we actually call CCAC to come, like if we had someone in crisis that needed an injection, could they actually come to our agency to provide that injection? So I'll answer your question in two parts. So originally, I think, in, and technically how it's set up, it's, it, as with most of our home visiting services, it's for individuals who are unable to leave their home because they're bed bound or what have you. But what we're seeing is that we really, we're in situations now where we're really having to kind of expand our, our focus, expand our lens and sort of start to understand that um, you don't necessarily have to be um, you know, bed bound to not be able to leave your home to get services. Um, so, I guess the short answer is yes, we do do that. Um, we typically wouldn't do it, uh, not even typically, we wouldn't do it as a crisis situation. I mean, it would really need to be an individual who was on care with us um, in order to do it. But the option is there to do it if it's an ongoing need. Um, and then there's, there's variances over whether CCC covers the cost or not, but that's dependent on a whole bunch of factors. So it's, uh, yeah, our, our home services are changing a bit we're looking at them a bit differently so yeah certainly yeah, just, um, just to add on to that that there um, we also don't realize that ultrasounds and x-rays can be done I, some people might not know that that can be done in the home as well and with a special application um, it, it can be covered by old hip so that was funny when we picked up their pens you could hear the whole room <laughs> it's stl imaging stl they usually go for long-term care type situations, but they're working as well with, with um, clients who are at home. They can bring the ultrasound or the x-ray to the home. And I, I used it with a client who was on a building up a, like a behavioral plan for tolerance, and they certainly were able to come into the home to do it. Um, <clears throat> being a case manager in the developmental services system, has been a real blessing for me because I've had the opportunity to live a million lives because when we walk with our clients, we're living the life with them. In that work, I've come to see and experience a lot of different systems, hospital systems, school systems, jail systems. And I've recognized that there's cultures in all of these different systems. And there's different paradigms that they all have. And I think working with CCAC has been a fantastic experience because they, I think they have a, the same view of things as we do, a very social model. But working with the, the typical health system, I find a little bit more challenging. They operate under a very medical kind of a view. When I work with them, they're very directive rather than collaborative. 
Um, they have absolutely no idea of what the community has and, and doesn't have. And, and I find like, I have to show you with my hands because I can't explain it. I find like our conversations are like this rather than like this. And it's so incredibly frustrating because I just feel like we, we spin and we, we don't really get anywhere. And I think that um, it's great to have CCAC because to me it's like a bridge to the health system. And it, it's been, I've had excellent opportunities to work with really good care um, managers and um, really we're all on the same page. Like I feel like we understand each other, you know? And I just, um, I just wanted to share that. Sorry, I'd be remiss if I didn't add because that really reminded me um, that we also have a program called Health Links. And I, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Health Links. Um, but essentially, their role, it's similar, if you've ever been through the, the CARE, like the Collaborative and Individualized Resource Program, it's a very similar thing, except focused in our healthcare system. And they have the ability, because they're fantastic, to pull in specialists that have been working, like all the doctors, and physically get them around one table. Um, so that, that can often be an important um, tool to advocating for your clients. Wonderful. Uh, any last questions? And you can obviously corner them. Uh, <laughs> and then we're going to do a bit of casework and, and talk a bit more about Jason. Here you go. Quick question. Does the CCAC services that you just mentioned uh, uh, work with you, like applies to children? Do we work with children? No, the services you just mentioned apply to children or just for adults? Sorry, if which services particular? Health links or like the home? The health, health links? links? Yeah, just now on the yeah. x-ray. Yeah, yeah, everyone. So, let's talk a bit about how you as a community are going to help support Jason and maybe in particular around his health needs, but if there was other things that came up. So, we're just going to, we're not going to go through each question, but can I get a volunteer from a couple of tables to just share a bit, maybe some highlights of what you talked about at your table? Uh, so we had talked about just maybe in the beginning is making sure to first bring the circle of care together, both internally and externally. Um, so we're not, we, that wasn't mentioned, so we weren't sure if that had actually taken place yet. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, highlighted in regards to the medical piece, which people addressed earlier, we had also discussed that, you know, with the decline in concerns regarding his mental health is maybe accessing CAMH to come in and um, do some assessments and work with you on tracking and be able to to follow through with some yes. other things. And then we also talked about uh, connecting with Surrey Police, with Angie, maybe bringing in um, other people uh, on board to, to deal with some of those things. Oh, and I was just, what we were talking about was um, making sure that if you find a connection, mm -hmm. um, that you're not, you don't hesitate to connect with them and ask them questions. Um, and in one of the recent things that I had done with someone, a CCAC worker on, um, I by the name of Jacqueline, once said to me, that was really good, don't assume you know what another sector can do. Um, go in knowing what you can do, and then really check in with each other on how you can work together. I like that. So don't just assume what the other sector can or maybe can't do, yeah. but no going with that clear focus and in a way it's like that first question we did in the welcome like if you know some people call it the elevator pitch and actually I just totally didn't do it myself uh, Sue who I've only just recently met says well what do you do and I'm like and I don't have my elevator pitch right so it's that you've got that person for two minutes what do you tell them so can it's really hard because we're so complex our jobs right and the different things so it's what is it you clearly can do and then you can get show with them and learn I think that's a great way to approach it